Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our the fourth year of our Journal Club, a season four of the AP SONPM Journal Club webinar. For it, today's topic is uh, nasal high flow therapy during neonatal endotracheal uh, intubation uh, by Hodgson uh, et al. in NEGM uh, 2022. Uh, to discuss this paper, we have our uh, trainee presenter, Dr. Jennifer Lee from John Hopkins All Children's. Florida, and it's a pleasure to have Dr. Brad Manley from Australia and Dr. Mark Hudak, uh, who'll serve as the mentors uh, for this session. As always, I uh, highly request everyone, except for the mentors and the moderators who are not speaking, uh, to be muted. Uh, if the mentors have any teaching learning points during the presentation, the moderators want to bring up a discussion point, feel free to pause the presentation for discussion. Uh, with that, I'll like uh, I'll have uh, Brian King introduce our first mentor, Dr. Brad Manley. Yeah, thanks. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Manley. He's a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and a consultant neonatologist at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, as well as a chief investigator for Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council's Center for Research Excellence in Newborn Medicine. He is a prolific clinical trialist, I'd say, um, and has led or supervised multiple trials focusing on high flow nasal cannula and other um, respiratory interventions for preterm infants with, I think, five uh, trials in New England Journal of Me Medicine in, in the last perhaps eight years, if I'm if, I'm, if I counted correctly, Brett. Um, you being too kind, so Brian. I think it's four. Oh, uh, well, so he's currently also the co-principal investigator for the PLUS trial of intratracheal budesonide. So there's going to be five soon, maybe, uh, mixed with surfactant, and also uh, the principal investigator of the platypus trial, which is an adapted platform trial that's going to allow for simultaneous assessment of multiple interventions and research questions in perinatal research. So um, he, um, and I obviously should have pointed out he's the, the um, that he was the PI for the SHINE trial that's being presented today. So it's a great pleasure for him to be here and give his insight. Thanks, Brian, and thanks to everyone and Vera for inviting me and uh, looking forward to being here. It's great to see so many of you joining. Uh, I'll have Maddie introduce Dr. Hudak for us. Great. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hudak today, who comes to us from the Uni University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville, where he's the professor and chair for the Department of Pediatrics the Chief of the Division of Neonatology, the Associate Director of the NICU Wolfson Children's Hospital, and the Associate Dean for Managed Care. Dr. Hudek earned his medical degree at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, where he also completed his pediatrics residency and a fellowship in neonatology. And he's a prolific researcher in the fields of neonatal cardiopulmonary physiology, neonatal infections, drug therapy and clinical trials, amongst others. Welcome, Dr. Hudak. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Jennifer, you can share your slides and start the presentation when ready. Is everyone able to see the slides or is it the presenter mode that came on? It's a presenter mode on. Okay, let me see. Why is it doing this? Uh, here, there we go. Oh. Sorry, we have two screens, so it's hard for me. <laughs> here we go, this one. Is it showing the correct one? Uh, no, uh, Jennifer, if you go to the share screen in Zoom, you may be able to select one which is full screen. Sure. Oh, yes. I think I see it now. Perfect. We'll try. Yeah, okay. okay. All righty. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm one of the third year neonatology fellows at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and I'll be presenting our journal class today. Um, so I don't have any uh, financial disclosures or conflicts of interest um, with any of the presented materials today. 
So this journal code will be about nasal high flow therapy during neonatal um, endothelial intubation. We luckily have um, one of the PIs here, Dr. Manley um, from Australia. This was actually published back in April, 2022. So it has been a, a year's worth of time actually since, more than a year's worth of time since it's been published. So going into neonatal intubations, a lot of the data about uh, the baseline of how important neonatal intubations has been pretty apparent. Um, but there's not, been not a lot of data about what kind of success rate there is, especially with how many attempts have been made and what kind of clinical changes can be seen with uh, intubations. Um, there was an initiative from um, the National Emergency Airway Registry for Neonates and near for neos which is a collaboration of multiple different centers across the world, um, basically um, targeted towards improving uh, neonatal intubations. Um, so they had published actually back in 2018, 2019, I'm sorry, um, uh, a standard, uh, a group compilation of data about um, intubation uh, attempts and also just standardizing and giving a baseline of what we are neonatal intubations have become. Um, they included about 26, uh, 20, 2,607 intubations um, included in the delivery room and also the NICU unit. You can see on the left graph on the bottom that um, the uh, with increasing um, expertise, um, you're going to be having much more success, especially on the first attempt. But of course, with the second attempt, you have an increased um, rate of success on the second attempt. But of course, with more expertise, you're going to start off with a greater successful attempt uh, percentage. Um, when they actually compiled it all into um, a chart, they did find that the actual compiling all the institutions, the first successful at attempt, uh, success was actually compiled to about 49%. Um, similarly, 46% in the delivery room as well. So not as high as you would kind of expect. Um, and most of the times, the reasons for um, a second attempt was because of usually some instability. So here they have documented a TIAE, which is a tracheal intubation adverse events. So the most common adverse events that they had seen were desaturations and severe de desaturations, but they kind of range from 29 to like 69 percent. But you can see that in the even in the NICU units, um, intubations had about 48 percent with um, severe desaturations and 31 percent in the delivery room. Okay. So the mechanism behind why neonatal intubations are a little bit more difficult, um, the, the anatomy of a neonate is a little bit, is different from an adult or even a child. They have lower residual, uh, functional residual capacity, and also they have a greater meta metabolic demand that makes it much more faster for them to decompensate during the, the procedure. And they flush that out with a hypoxemia, bradycardia, hypertension, and also for more of the long-term aspects, kind of IVH is another concern as well, especially for our smaller babies. So one of the um, biggest things that have been, kind of, have been fleshed out in kind of the adult world um, was a term called apneic oxygenation. Um, back in the 1950s, it started with an anesthesiologist named Dr. Fruchter, who was actually an American anesthesiologist uh, that kind of studied in depth about apneic oxygenation. And um, his the apneic oxygenation was basically using any kind of supplemental oxygen. Um, in their case, they used nasal cannulation um, during anesthesia to allow for kind of a sustained levels of sufficient oxygen um, in the alveoli and in the blood um, to allow uh, uh, even without any kind of active lung expansion. So this concept was more used in the operating room and then transitioned to the um, emergency department. Um, but you can see here, this is a, a meta-analysis that was actually done in emergency intubations in adults. And they had screened to about eight different studies and found that the apneic oxygenation did um, decreased um, the rates of hypoxemia, increased the first rates, uh, first pass intubation success, and increased also the peri-intubation oxygen saturation. High flow therapy also has been um, of a note as well as one of the newer kind of in the last uh, like 10 to 20 years that has been used for respiratory management, um, peri-extubation. 
Um, but it's been attractive due to many of its physiological um, attributes. Um, it is um, that to reduce anatomical dead space, also decrease in airway resistance, and also increase in lung compliance, and kind of maintain a certain level of positive pressure at the end of expir expiration. So these kind of translate into uh, decreased respiratory work during breathing and improvement of hypoxemia. Um, even now, a lot of the adult anesthesiology uh, societies recommend the use of high flow therapy for awake tracheal intubations. Um, but in France, um, Dr. Miguel Montañez um, was one of the um, one of the first um, anesthesiologists that actually used um, high flow nasal therapy um, to kind of prove that using um, high flow nasal cannula during tracheal intubations could really decrease um, the hypoxemic periods. Um, during intubation, and they compared that with a bag valve mass. And that continued with other different um, physicians using um, high flow nasal therapy. Um, this was another study done in, doc, uh, in uh, France with Dr. Vorch, another RCT that used high flow nasal cannula during endotracheal intubation, comparing that with um, basically a face mask and found that compared to high flow nasal cannula, um, the high flow nasal cannula therapy was much more effective in decreasing the um, time of hypoxemia and increasing the apneic um, oxygenation period. A big, big study that was actually done also in France as well was the fluoride 2 study done in adults as well. Again, comparing NIV to um, high flow therapy. This one was a little bit of a mixed bag, finding no difference between the two. But in general, most of the studies that have been done, especially in adult population, has proven that high flow therapy um, is a useful and uh, an effective way of preventing um, desaturations um, during intubation attempts. So the THRIVE trial was actually another study done by an anesthesiologist. Um, in 2018, and he was um, using he utilized the ter the, um, the concept of apneic oxygenation in children. So this was one of the first studies that actually used high flow therapy um, during um, uh, uh, intubations and and using to see if that would have a translate to the same effects as in adults um, for children. And he did find also as well that there was a decreased. Um, oh, sorry, an increased rate of um, apneic, uh, duration of apneic oxygenation during intubations. But of course, this was only limited because they had about six babies that were only, only six patients that were only less than six months old. But this kind of brought into focus that high flow therapy could be possibly translated for use in, in children and neonates. So looking at the journal um, club, I'm using the consort checklist to determine um, um, the how our randomized control trial for this study is being done. So, so I'll go Jennifer, through... uh, I think mm -hmm. it's a good point to uh, move uh, to Dr. Manley and uh, uh, she, uh, Dr. Manley, like Jennifer reviewed um, in a great detail about the background and stuff. Can you tell us about your experience, how you brought this trial from all the adults and how you came out the idea about doing this and what was your understanding of the literature at that time? Well, Jennifer's given a fantastic summary, I, I must say. Um, the evidence is fairly compelling in the paediatric and, and adult literature, and and many of you will already know that, that this is quite standard of care in many centres around the world for uh, children and adults undergoing anaesthesia, um, particularly for those sort of higher risk adult patients, airway anomalies, et cetera, where apneic oxygenation has been used for years uh, and very successfully. And I guess this has really stemmed not from any past experience ourselves using high flow or any sort of supplemental ox supplementary oxygen during intubation, but just from the problem that is the very low rate of successful intubation. And I think when we all see those numbers, we probably think, oh, I don't think that's my unit, or I don't think I don't think I only have a 66% success rate. But I think if you actually monitored it, you might find that you do. And it's quite scary, isn't it? Like half of all neonatal intubations successful at the first attempt, many of those having some physiological instability during them. And then even more importantly, with this is becoming more of a problem as our trainees uh, face the prospect of fewer and fewer potential intubations. You know, in, in my hospital here, we are, we are intubating babies 
exponentially less than we used to even a decade ago with the use of LISA and MIST procedures, the avoidance of mechanical ventilation, the avoidance of complications, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, really to, we really need to be, um, we really need to be having successful intubations for our trainees such that they gain confidence and competence moving forward. And, and this is one potential way of doing that. Uh, Dr. Huda, uh, since you've been involved with all the trainees for such a long time uh, for it, um, is that something uh, you thought you would, we need a trial to figure out with all the new trainees coming in and the difficulty with first intubation? <clears throat> well, I, my observation is that, yes, I mean, the opportunity is at a premium. And um, I think everybody who is in their fellowship knows that the uh, um, getting experience with innovation as a resident is not a certain thing um, for lots of reasons that Dr. Manley talked about in his article. But, but there's also the factor that there's more competition for procedures with ATPs being a larger part of the workforce and needing to obtain and maintain competency. So, so I think, um, you know, my, my anecdotal observations over more years that I want to sort of quantitate is that, uh, Yes, the average uh, number of procedures that a given resident does by the end of their residency is much smaller. Um, delivery room innovations for things like meconium, um, you know, um, hygiene is, is is zero, essentially, these days. And um, so I think um, we are in a situation where we have to confront, honestly, the fact that, that uh, the efficiency proficiency of the neonatal care team to do this um, in babies, whether emergently or routinely, is severely attrited over the years. Yeah, that's a great point uh, for it. Jennifer, you can continue the presentation. Okay. Um, so going over through some of the concert checklists, the beginning part of the title and abstract portion, <laughs> um, um, it was pretty well defined and met most of the criteria. One of the few things that um, they noticed was that the title did not include um, that identification as a study as a randomized trial, but that can be easily um, detained by reading the article. Um, and also there was no blinding um, for this specific study. Um, and I'll touch upon it a little bit later as well, um, uh, as well why it was not. But um, of course, with the putting on the prongs, it's a little bit more difficult to um, blind when they're putting on the intervention in front of them. So going into the introduction, the background, um, they had a good idea of how uh, explaining of what is pretty much known. And as we just talked about a little bit, intubation opportunities are getting scarcer, especially for the pediatric residents. Um, it's been mostly usurped by the fellows and of course the um, APPs um, that are uh, more of the front line for um, in intubations downstairs in the delivery room and in the neonatal unit. Um, also the baseline first intubation attempts like we discussed is pretty poor, surprisingly like 49% um, in the NICU units. Um, physiological instability is also a big issue for um, um, intubations. And of course some units do use RSI during, uh, before an intubation attempt if there is time. Um, but of course, um, the, the desaturations and bradycardia are the main reasons for having a, a second attempt or a continued attempts. And also going into high flow nasal cannula as well, like we had discussed before, um, was a, an appropriate uh, or another way of giving uh, non-invasive ventilation as well. So the objectives were also to find its use in neonates. Of course, the pathology of our infants are a little bit different as they all have some sort of lung disease, at least in the NICU unit or the reason for their intubation. And then providing some sort of, of support. In most of our units, um, we do not usually provide any kind of support during um, neonatal intubations. So the research um, question that we were able to really uh, clearly elucidate was that can high flow therapy improve likelihood of successful first attempt intubation without physiological instability? So going into the methods section, this is an RCT that was done over about two years from November 2018 to April 2021. It was done in two tertiary NICUs in Melbourne, um, Australia. 
Um, their inclusion criteria included infants requiring oral ET tube intubation in the delivery room or the NICU. And their exclusion criteria was um, any intubations that were not orally done, urgent intubations done by a clinician, um, heart rate less than 120 before randomization, any contraindications to high flow therapy, such as um, facial abnormalities, um, cyanotic congenital heart disease, or also, unfortunately, I guess during this time as well, was COVID um, was very rampant as well. So any suspected or proven severe COVID-2 infection in the mother or infant. Um, they were randomly assigned at bedside to high flow or standard care based on postmenstrual age uh, stratified to less than 28 weeks or greater. And of course, use of uh, pre-medication for intubation. Um, Subsequent so intubations were also used in the same infants if they had any differing use of premedication or at least one week between the intubations. So what was uh, very nice about the study was as well, their unit of randomization was actually by episodes and not by specific infants um, as well. So an intub could have multiple um, different intubations included into the study. So the intervention in was basically applying um, high flow therapy to these infants during their uh, once they were um, assigned to being uh, needing uh, intubation, a routine intubation. And you can see in the bottom um, little uh, tape, little gra uh, pictures there, there are methods of how to apply um, the nasal prongs gently behind the ears, and also the prescribed amount of flow was very well detailed in in this um, in their intervention section. So they had about eight um, liters per uh, liters of flow that was uh, given for all the infants. And then uh, whatever their previous FIO2 they were at, they continued unless there was a desaturation less than 90. And then they were increased in their FIO2 up to 100%. Um, their standard practice in their units were, um, except in the delivery room, was pre-medication with the atropine, fentanyl, and the succimethanium. Um, of course, with intubations and all, and even their, in every separate unit, there's going to be things that are at a discretion of the clinician. So they did uh, specify that the pre-intubation FIO2, the use of pre-oxygenation, and the use of video laryngoscopy, and the start time of start and duration and end of intubation attempt was left up to the clinician and the status of the patient. So the outcomes, the primary outcome was very well defined. It was actually very simple and very nicely put. Um, it was a successful first intubation attempt without physiological instability. So you have three different factors that you were looking at. You were looking at success, and it was defined by having the um, in correct placement confirmed by um, the um, colorimeter detector. And then it had to be the first intubation attempt, which they define as well with the laryngoscape bl blade being placed uh, beyond the infant's lifts until its removal from the mouth, whether or not the ET tube was actually inserted or not. And their physiological instability definition was the desaturation of more than 20% from baseline or bradycardia, um, which was a heart rate less than 100. They included secondary outcomes as well, um, basically defining the physiological instability. So, um, so the median oxygen saturation, heart rate during intubation, any time and duration of desaturation and bradycardia, duration of um, and number of intubation attempts, and any ser serious adverse events. So uh, Dr. Manley, if you can provide some insight, uh, how did you come up with these primary outcomes and while designing the study, uh, were they derived from adult data or did you have plan to have a long-term outcome such as RDS or BPD, uh, which could change? Yeah, thanks, Farrell. We we did talk long and hard about the choice of primary outcome for this study. And it's interesting to see what, what others have chosen. And we might discuss that later on as well with Jennifer. But um, we wanted some, some reflection of successful intubation. Um, because let's be honest, this is this is about successfully intubating our babies and uh, and reducing the number of intubation attempts that can be harmful. So we went with a combination of success and safety. I think you know we could argue about the the uh, the amount of desaturation and the choice of bradycardia. I, I don't think that's very important, but we wanted it to be something that people would think would be worth stopping the intubation attempt for. And I think. 
in most of our hands, a, a significant desaturation or a bradycardia would be the case. Um, so that's what we went with. Uh, we acknowledge that we did not collect longer term in hospital or out of hospital outcomes. And that's, I guess, a limitation of this study. But then again, that wasn't really the main aim of the study. We didn't go into this saying we're going to reduce BPD. We enrolled all sorts of babies, uh, including term infants, preterm infants that were more mature. And uh, Jennifer will tell us the demographics in a minute. But there was a, a quite a heterogeneous population enrolled in this trial. So we went with the very short-term outcomes as a proof of concept, I guess, or a proof of procedural efficacy. But we can certainly discuss that more. Yep, it's a great insight. Uh, Jennifer, you can resume. Um, so the baseline data um, for them was about 29% successful first intubation without success without any physiological instability. And they used about a 90% uh, power to detect significant increase from 30 to 50%. They had multiple um, different standpoints that were able to monitor for safety analysis. They had external data and safe, safety monitoring boards um, performed at different um, time points of collection, sample collections. And they had a one-blinded interim um, efficacy analysis after 50% the sample was, um, if, if there was any safety concerns or high significant difference between the, and the data points. The method was an intention to treat um, if, if a patient did not undergo a treatment assignment, a per protocol analysis was used. Um, their secondary outcomes uh, were compared to, according to risk difference and two-sided 95% um, confidence intervals. And they had pre-specified pre subgroup analysis of the primary outcomes, um, such as the postmenstrual age and then the use of pre-medication and also the experience level of the operator, which they define um, as inexperienced with less than 20 and experienced as 20 or more intubations. So going into um, their study points of um, what they had initially started with, they had about 627 intubations that were assessed for eligibility. Um, a lot of them, didn't, uh, 165 of them did not meet a criteria based on their exclusion criteria. Um, so they had a good number, about 462 um, that were eligible. Um, but of those um, 204, about half of those were not actually included in the and they did have a couple, um, about 150 of the pay, of the intubation attempts um, that were not included due to ha not having a researcher available or um, did not have a researcher notified, uh, which could have been um, due to out of routine working hours, uh, which is I'm not sure, but um, could have presented a little bit of selection bias in that sense. But um, 43%, 43 intubation attempts were also lacking in prospective um, consent for the trial. Hey Brett, could you comment on on this area and and in particular the process of consent in the trial? Because I believe um, you allowed for um, post randomization consent. Is that correct? Yeah. So firstly, I just uh, say these these trials are really hard to do. For those of you who've who've tried to do one, you'll know this. Um, and Kate Hodgson, who's a, a an amazing neonatologist and colleague here in Melbourne, this was for her PhD, and we we've had quite a lot of success getting our PhD students to run their own trials, but it means they take a lot of responsibility. So she she was getting out of bed at all hours on weekends and weeknights as best she could. But uh, as Jennifer also pointed out, uh, we had COVID running right through the middle of this trial. So we actually think we did, we did a reasonably good job, but absolutely, Jennifer, I mean, it, there's always a bit of a selection bias or, you know, you always got, got to ask yourself, are the results generalizable? And hopefully the demographics will go some way to allay any concerns there. Um, with regards to the consent, wherever possible, we use prospective consent, but um, as with other trials, some of our ethics committees in this part of the world are willing to provide retrospective or deferred consent approvals, um, sorry, our IRBs, um, uh, for certain types of uh, trials. And this is one of them. So where there was an emergency intubation, and by definition, that was nearly always the delivery room when there was an unexpected or unplanned intubation, or in the first 24 hours of a NICU stay, they uh, granted us 
a deferred consent pathway. So to be clear, we always tried for prospective consent, but if it was early in the baby's admission, again, which it often is, these babies are normally being intubated in the first hours of their admission or in the delivery room, we did have a deferred consent pathway. So that parents were approached as soon as possible after the trial entry for ongoing in, uh, enrollment of their child. So that is a very interesting feature. I'm not sure that that uh, particular process is something that we use in the United States very often. Um, my understanding, looking at it though, you were able, except in you know one or two cases perhaps, to get the retrospective uh, uh, consent, which I would say would be, you know, sort of information sharing rather than consent, but. But it did it did give you the ability to continue to randomize that baby in the future if the baby met criteria. So um, yeah, we we could talk we could talk for hours about this, Mark. And it's I know it's very controversial in some parts of the world. Um, although we are starting to see some trials in the in North America using a retrospective or deferred consent pathway or even a waiver of consent in some circumstances. We've, we've run entire trials using deferred consent pathways. And in fact, I'm involved in a trial now looking at oxygen in the delivery room, which has a, a full waiver of consent um, and another that has an opt-out consent process. So these are things we're seeing more and more of, particularly for extremely low risk or no risk comparative effectiveness trials or for emergency situations. And uh, you know, you can imagine it's hard to do a trial of CPR without a waiver of consent. And uh, you might be able to argue in some parts of the world like Australia that it's hard to do a trial like this without some backup process. Now, of course, you can do it. It just takes twice as long and you miss out on twice as many babies. So uh, there are pros and cons of that for sure. But we could discuss that more in the discussion if others would like to. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think I think there should be a greater role for waiver of consent. In some of these, as you say, low risk trials where it's just not feasible to get um, informed consent uh, ahead of time. But... Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Jennifer Nerzi. Um, so, out of those um, 258 uh, intubation attempts, were randomly and uh, randomly assigned. Um, and they were equally split 129. And like we had a discussion right now, a little bit about the perspective and retrospective consent, which was a little bit uh, different from what we are able to do here in the States. Um, but they were had a good uh, number of um, patients that gave um, consent retrospectively as well. Um, oops, sorry. Um, um, some of them were also excluded. Um, very few actually um, from, were randomly assigned and uh, into the intubation, um, even though intubation did not actually occur, but they had a pretty uh, decent amount uh, that were equally shared into the in, um, treatment group and the standard care group, 124, 127, and 100, 202 infants actually um, that were included into this study. So going into the demographics, um, there was generally not much difference between the two um, groups. Their median um, age, um, gestational age had Dr. Mantley touched upon was pretty broad. Um, they had from 25 weekers all the way up to 31 weekers in the high flow group and um, 25 to 29 in the standard care group, but their median gestational age was uh, rock solid in the middle at 27 for both. Um, their weight also as well was pretty similar at 976 and 907 uh, between the two groups. Um, their median age at intubation um, was a little bit different um, within in, in hours. The high flow group did have seven hours, so it was a little bit earlier than the 13 hours for the standard care group. But um, most of all, when you look at the uh, the data points, uh, the sorry, the table, um, there most of the patients were on the similar respiratory support. Majority of them were on CPAP, and their FiO2 actually was pretty similar with um, the average being about 0.62 for both the um, standard care and the high flow therapy group. Um, something of interest as well was also the operator experience level. They had a fair share amount of split between the inexperienced and also experienced in, the, in this study as well. It's interesting just to ask maybe what we, 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 that was a fairly arbitrary decision to use that cutoff of 20 prior intubations. I mean, it'd be interesting to ask ourselves now if we repeated the study, what we would call experienced and inexperienced, or at least 
uh, what we would expect our junior trainees to have achieved um, or, or NNPs uh, or respiratory therapists. I mean, I think it's really common now for our junior trainees to leave a six-month NICU uh, traineeship with fewer than 10 intubations and often fewer than five, and that's pretty scary. We have some residents who after three years have not successfully done one innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and then going into our primary outcomes, um, so the juice of the study. Um, so they did successfully see that um, there was a decrease in, uh, sorry, an increase in successful intubations on the first attempt uh, without any physiological instability for the high flow group, um, 62 intubation attempts versus 40. And then they split it up into which ones had like more successful intubation on um, first attempt and physiological instability. And those were also increased in the high flow group as well. Um, the, when they did the pre-specified subgroup analysis into postmenstrual age and the pre-medication, there also was an increase in um, the high flow therapy group, um, a, an increase in the successful intubations, um, meaning the primary outcomes. But the most um, exaggerated or kind of the most astounding kind of effect that they saw was especially in the inexperienced um, uh, intubations. You can see here that um, those that were on the high flow therapy group um, for the inexperienced um, had increased from the standard care group from 16% to 49%. Um, of course, there was an increase also for the experienced group as well, but not as great as the inexperienced group. And you've always got to be careful with composite outcomes, don't you? Because you can get all sorts of strange effect uh, effects happening, but it's 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 nice to see in this study that the direction of effect is uh, the same across all uh, of the components of the, the composite primary outcome and across all of the pre-specified subgroup analyses as well. And, and just to highlight that, look at that 16% uh, rate of successful intubation without any physiological instability in, in the inexperienced group. That's scary stuff. Thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting thing about that subgroup analysis there is it, it, um, it's nice that you're imbalance from the previous slide um, in terms of percent experience versus inexperience um, really allows you to sort of say that that difference is a minimal difference, right? So I think that's that's mm -hmm. a point to make there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and also just, you know, it might be just chance or coincidence, but you can see that with high flow, the inexperienced success rate without physiological instability comes up to mirror that of the experienced intubators. So it's mm -hmm. really, that's where a lot of the effect is happening there, although there's still a positive effect even for the experienced intubators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then going into um, a, more, a little bit more at the, the clinician bedside, the number needed to treat would be actually, would be six, um, and which is not a lot compared to how many intubations we probably do in a, a day or two. Um, but basically this um, was showing that there was an improved number of successful intubation attempts uh, with no physiological instability with the high flow therapy. So secondary outcomes, um, looking into that as well, um, the peripheral oxygen saturation throughout these intubation attempts, um, there's a graph on the left that you can see with a supplemental figure um, to the, the journal club, the article. Um, the blue line is the standard care group, and then the orange line is actually the high flow therapy group, and the bottom is basically the time durations um, cumulatively going uh, for, uh, longer and longer. Um, but you can see here that the, the orange line group, the high flow therapy group had a uh, sustained in more increase in the uh, increased level of saturation throughout the duration of their intubation attempts. Um, and then when they put into data points, they said uh, the median value of outcome for the saturations during the high flow therapy group was 94, and their range was from 83 to 98%, while the standard care group had a much lower dips um, um, with a median at 89 and ranging from 79 to 95%. Um, the number of intubation attempts for procedure, though, for either or did not really change much. They were both a uh, they had one to two attempts, but the median value was two. And the duration of um, intubation attempts um, as well were pretty um, similar as well between the two groups. Uh, okay. high flow. So 
high flow therapy had 50 and the standard care had 46 seconds. That interplay between the duration of, of the intubation and the procedure, it's it's a little difficult to tease out because if high flow, if this concept of apneic oxygenation in the babies that were apneic, we'll come back to that, is true, one of the ways that this might be efficacious is to calm everybody down because the heart rate and the desaturation uh, and the saturations are good. And you could sort of paradoxically have an intubation attempt that takes longer but is more likely to be successful. And so it's there's a lot of there's a lot going on in both directions there. It's a little bit hard to know. Conversely, if uh, you know the baby's stable and there's a better view of the airway and the sats are good, maybe it's quicker to do an intubation, but it's it's really difficult to tease that out actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then a little bit more into their intubations and in which desaturation occurred, there was also um, a less number of intubations where that happened. They had 35 in the high flow compared to the standard care of 50. And the durations also were um duration of desaturations were also um, decreased in the uh, high flow therapy group at 34 seconds versus uh sorry, um 65 seconds versus 63, uh, 64. Um, the time to bradycardia also were pretty similar. They were both around 39 um, seconds, and then duration was also similar to 27 to 31. Um, it was noted, though, also their severe uh, adverse effects. Um, they did have a couple more um, in the standard care group. They had two that required CPR epinephrine after one hour after um, intubation, and um, six versus two of pneumothoraxes that were diagnosed within 72 hours. Um, and more that were um, five that were crying out of the six um, of uh, needling or drainage and death uh, was three to one more in the standard care group as well. And what was interesting as well was the video laryngoscopy. Again, that was that left up to the clinician um, discretion, but they did have a couple. They had about 10% in the um, nasal, can the high flow therapy group, and then 7% actually in the um, standard care group. Um, this was just noted in the study. Um, they did not do a specify uh, analysis with just a video laryngoscopy patients. Um, so going into the discussion, there are many strengths to this study. Um, obviously, intubations are not an easy um, procedure. It's very time consuming. And it seems like with the results that we are finding that there may be more ap applicability in residents and trainee, especially seeing that increase in um, the number of uh, a number of successful intubations without physical instability in the an experienced group coming up to level playing the living field um, to the experienced um, experienced practitioners. Um, they had a strict definitions for their outcomes that led to um, these uh, results. Um, the methods, data collection process, statistical analysis were all very clearly defined. Um, they had no major protocol deviations that were reported as well. Um, and what was uh, interesting of note too was the video reviews as well. They limited bias by having um, all of these intubations recorded by video. I think they only had about two that were able to be recorded. Um, but then these findings were also corroborated um, by another separate independent reviewer as well. Um, they, again, to touch upon the previous point about the limitations. So the blinding was not done. They addressed this because they had some concerns about nasal obstruction with uh, using a sham procedure by just putting a nasal cannula with no flow in it, which is reasonable. And especially since they didn't have a real cap on how small these babies could go. And they had a good amount of babies that were um, elbow babies. So that was a um, consideration that was made with thought. Um, external validity as well. This was done in two tertiary centers in a single country. Um, so the generalizability to an, an other centers may be a little bit different, especially with different um, uh, pre-medication um, usage and also um, uh, applicability of using um, hypotherapy in the delivery room and also um, resources basically as well. Um, again, Dr. Manley had touched upon the point that this was not meant to be a short, uh, long-term outcome, um, uh, looking at long-term outcomes, but it would have been interesting to look at also the BPD and IVH um, outcomes or neurodevelopmental outcomes in these patients. Um, but it's also difficult to determine whether the benefit was due to the flow that was being given since all of them were on eight liters per 
uh, liters of flow, or whether it was the supplemental oxygen, or whether it was also placebo, since um, they did have, see such a uh, much as more significant effect in the in experience group, whether seeing that nasal cannula there provide them a little bit more reassurance. But we do also notice that the intubation cap times were not, not kept, but there was no difference in between the duration of intubation attempts in either of those groups. And I think we touched upon a little bit about the consenting process as well, how it was a little bit different in that they did allow for retrospective um, consent, allowing for um, a good number of patients to be included into the study as well. So conclusions are that it was a very well-designed multi-center randomized clinical trial that had impressive results. I think that was long awaited as mostly has been done in the adult world and the pediatric world, but that had not been um, generalized to the neonate world. Um, and of course, we've been using that, uh, Lisa also has been um, using support during, in, during, um, uh, in, during using, during, um, insertion of the catheter as well. So it should be something that, sh especially when it's a routine intubation, is not um, it's not a hard thing to apply nasal prongs uh, while intubating, especially if you have such impressive results as these, um, improving your, uh, uh, decreasing your rates of physiological instability during intubations. So some changes to clinical practice that should be considered. I think one of the most jarring things that like I got from this study was um, about how it's it, it's definitely something that is uh, easily can be done um, in a lot of our centers, but also how it can be approved. Um, it can be used specifically for our trainees and people that have, don't do many intubations, especially in neonates, such as in the emergency department as well. Um, the use of hyponasal cannula, although this is what they specifically use as well, maybe some uh, um, any kind of support would be um, beneficial for um, routine intubations, and especially pre-medication as well, which may not be the standard in every single unit in the uh, states, especially as well. But any kind of interventions that can help prolong this apneic oxygenation period would be helpful in improving intubation success. And of course, this was only meant for routine intubations, not emergent intubations, as was stated in their clinical uh, in their randomized control trial. So that's something that is taken of note. But overall, this is going to be helpful to a uh, few interventions can actually increase the success of intubations and finding ways to really delay that time period for successful intubation um, has more cl clinical significance to the bedside uh, clinicians. So this should be definitely something to consider to be actually used um, for um, in real life for a lot of our the NICU um, providers. Um, some of the next steps. So, as Jennifer, well. before we move mm -hmm. to next steps, uh, I'm going to launch a poll about what our uh, trainees and audience do, uh, what their current practice is, and go from there uh, for it. And in the meantime, uh, Dr. Manley, we've been talking about long term outcomes and things. Uh, so, what's your opinion? Is it worth it to track those outcomes considering we are seeing decreased number of intubation practice by the trainees and uh, them getting the trainees able to get it much earlier is is the all important outcome we need. Yeah, so we're, we're part of the near for NEOs collaboration that Jennifer mentioned right near the start, uh, which I think is led by Liz Foglia and the Philadelphia team. Apologies if it isn't. Um, so we are tracking intubation success rates. We're also tracking interventions that are being used before and during intubation attempts. And that now includes the use of respiratory support or supplemental oxygen, uh, given the results of this trial, whereas previously it did not. So we'll be able to, I guess, in that sort of, uh, in that larger data set involving many US centers and others around the world, you know, continue to monitor success rates and the influence of, of uh, video laryngoscopy, respiratory support, supplemental oxygen, and experience of the uh, operator on, on success rates and instability. So I think that's really important. Um, going back to longer term outcomes in this trial, I think even if I was to if we were to design it again, we still wouldn't include longer term outcomes. This is quite a heterogeneous population, as I mentioned earlier. And although the um, 
although the median gestational age or postmenstrual age at randomization was was extremely preterm or very preterm, there were all sorts of babies included. So I think tracking longer term outcomes in this population wouldn't have been very useful. And, and anyway, there were only 200 and something babies. And we all know how many uh, how many patients you need in a trial to be able to determine even even outcomes like BPD, let alone longer term outcomes. So I, I think this is very much a proof of concept and proof of procedure sort of trial uh, with the key short term outcomes that we need to, to change practice. Um, it's very interesting. Some of the feedback we've had since the trial was presented, you know, we've had all sorts of things from this is a stupid trial. Of course, it helps to give oxygen during the intubation. Well, now we know that. So I think that that, that that's useful to move forward with. Um, we've had people say they've already been doing it using either CPAP, which uh, of course may be trickier to intubate babies on CPAP than on the more low file, low profile prongs, whether that's high flow or vapor therm or, or normal nasal cannula, whatever you like to call them. Um, so I think this is showing that those smaller prongs do, don't interfere with intubation. The, the blinding I just wanted to go back to, Jennifer, we, we'd had experience with a sham procedure in the Optimus trial, which many of you will be familiar with now. That's the, the largest randomised trial of, of uh, less invasive, or as we called it, minimally invasive surfactant therapy. And we actually did a fake procedure on half of the patients in that trial. We went around behind the curtain and we pretended to, pretended to do a missed procedure or Lisa procedure and made lots of noises and uh, you know, acted it out and everything. And we did talk about doing sham procedures in this, but we really wanted to know um, that the groups were different in the sense that just putting the prongs on, as Jennifer alluded to, may somehow change outcomes. We wanted to make sure that people could intubate okay with the prongs in situ because they weren't used to doing that. And we wanted to see how often things went wrong, you know, how often the, the, the equipment failed or the prongs fell out. So we did decide to to not blind this trial. And, and as you know, many respiratory support trials are unblinded because it's, it's very difficult to do so. I'm going to just share our results for it. So we see at least one third of our uh, audience members who polled uh, still use CPAP. Uh, Dr. Hood, I can uh, direct this question to you. So it's the results of this trial which clearly showed that having some support in high flow helps with intubation attempts. So can we use this CPAP to support, can we use this data to support the use of CPAP or does it deserve its own trial? Well, <clears throat> that's... Um... Um, interesting question. Um, I think I think the mechanical differences between the cannula and the CPAP would say that you might not automatically be able to extrapolate from one to the other. Um, I would think that the 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 types of physiological benefits that you get from cannula and CPAP are going to be fairly equivalent at eight liters flow on the cannula, but uh, it's just a question of whether or not the technical issues with being able to innovate around the CPAP as opposed to cannula are going to affect your success rate. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Manley, you have any comments on general reliability to CPAP? Yeah, I agree. I don't think you can generalize these results. Whether you're using subnasal Hudson prongs or some sort of a midline snorkel apparatus or whatever you're using, um, the maneuvering that that apparatus and getting a good airway view and managing the baby is very different and we see this with Lisa or Mist uh, where in our practice most of those babies are still on CPAP at the time that they're receiving the the intubation you know some of our trainees and and some of our senior doctors really struggle to to perform the procedure because of the the bulkiness of the device around the patient. So I, I and and when you see conversely, when you see it done with high flow or low profile nasal cannula, you'll see that it it, it is, you know, that the operator pays no heed. They don't even know that it's there most of the time because it's not in the way at all and doesn't in any way affect the ability of them to to get a view and intubate. So I think they're quite different. I find I find it fascinating though that there are, you know. Several things about the survey here. Pre-medication, I would expect would have the highest uh, adherence to the guidelines. Um, video laryngoscopy, logically second, but you know you've got ten out of twenty-one centers that are trying to innovate using some you know oxygen 
you know, positive pressure support during the procedure, that that's more than I would have expected, actually. And there's a trial about there's a trial underway in the US, which we might discuss later. I'm not sure if Jennifer's about to bring that up, but we can talk about what they're doing that's a little bit different. Um, there's just something in the chat. Do you want me to discuss that now, Viral, or at the uh, end? Yeah, we can have Jennifer finish and then we'll go through all the yeah. questions from the audience. Uh, Jennifer, you want to wrap up the yes. presentation? Yes. I'm probably not going to talk about that US study, but so you can touch it really. But I was just looking at different um, um, articles that have been currently published, and I saw that you guys had already. Um, done a sub study as well on looking at cerebral oxygenation during um, in the intubation with a high flow therapy. Um, they had included the 19 intubations um, with 11 with high flow and then also eight that were just standard. And they, of course, com comparing with um, the de decreased time of um, desaturation with the high flow therapy, there was a, a less, uh, the regional cerebral oxygen saturation also fell more slowly in that therapy group as well. Not surprising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the major limitation of this sub-study were the numbers. Um, I already mentioned that Kate was often, or one of us was often coming in after hours and rushing in to be there in time. And it was just not practical to get the NEARS devices onto more babies. It would have been fantastic to, to look at them all. But um, given that peripheral saturations were better maintained, then it, it's not surprising that NEARS may be as well. And, and of course, all we're reporting is what we found. We don't know if that's important or not in the longer term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so to wrap it up, um, I think a lot of the benefits, especially was seen within certain subpopulations and then just thinking about like um, recently as well, video laryngoscopy has been much of the preferred method for especially training for residents, finding that even though it may increase a little bit of the duration of intubation attempts, the success was also much greater. Um, but also using that with this study as well and, and with high flow nasal cannula um, um, with their uh, intubation attempts to see if there was a much greater um, success rate as well with specifically these inexperienced, inexperienced group. Um, of course, the generalizability, as we have talked about as well, um, you know, practices that we just did this poll on as well, the pre-medication would be helpful, um, especially if it was used pretty much universally within all the units. And of course, the, it seems like there was a lot of resources that were available to Dr. Bounley to be able to do this study with the high flow nasal cannula, the video, and a lot of the, um, the people that were involved uh, with this study. So of course, it might be difficult to replicate the study exactly in per se as Dr. Manley's group has done, but um, maybe something is something definitely to consider, especially in a tertiary unit with much more uh, resources available and in, in providing some, some sort of support during um, intubation attempts. Uh, so Dr. Huda, coming to you about the technical requirements to do the intervention uh, stuff in, in uh, settings where these resources are not ready available. Is this something it's worth the investment for the resources, uh, for the centers to do it? Which, which resources specifically? Are you a high flow setup and everything because they may not have one. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, use CPAP? I think based on this study and other data, I think this would be a very, very good investment of resources. It's not a, it's not a major capital investment in terms of cost. Um, I do think that it provides a definite benefit. And um, uh, also, I think, um, you know, going back to Dr. Manley's thought that maybe it provides some, some better psychological comfort to have that there, and that facilitates operator, um, um, you know, uh, success. I think, I think these are important things. And certainly, we spend a lot more money on a lot of things that are a lot less impactful. Okay. Yeah, we've been able to incorporate this into our routine practice in the NICU. We, we've not taken it to the delivery room as yet. Um, so we're trying for this to be routine, especially for inexperienced operators. So the high flow is just prepared at the bedside prior to a, a, uh, a planned intubation and uh, is applied in all cases uh, where we can. But of course, the immediate question or one response to your question, Viral, is well, high flow is expensive. Could we just do this with low flow? And that is, of course, an important question. And, and it is unclear from this study whether how much of the effect is from placebo versus flow versus oxygen. 
but it makes sense that providing oxygen versus not providing oxygen would be a good thing, uh, whether that's from, you know, some sort of wafted oxygen or from low flow cannula or oxygen off the wall. Um, we don't know from this study. Um, but I think the the North American study that's underway uh, led in Philadelphia by um, Heidi Herrick and, and Liz Fogley as part of that may go some way to answering that. They're using six litres still, but just using uh, what they describe as normal nasal cannula, low flow nasal cannula, without the sort of vapor therm or the Fisher and Paykel devices. Um, so that will be really interesting to see whether they show a similar effect. Brett, can I ask or go back to your decision when you were planning the trial to use high flow? Because um, as Jennifer pointed out, 90%, and as we've been talking about, 90% of the babies are on CPAP. And I presume you were already using Lisa or Mist in both of your units prior to doing this trial. So you had some comfort with CPAP. Because to, to me, I think that still the, if I'm honest, the, the thing that I still want to know is, can't we just use the device that the baby's already on in order to assist with our intubation? Like why, if a baby is failing CPAP, why take them off CPAP to then intubate them? It seems to me the most and most practical and pragmatic thing to do is just intubate them on CPAP. And I think many centers are getting very comfortable, as you mentioned, with MIST, with doing the MIST procedure on CPAP, which I don't think an intubation is requires that much more of a view or that much more technique than getting a thin catheter. Some would argue some thin catheters are even harder to get in than a uh, an endotracheal tube. So, so to me, I think the most you know resource minimizing approach to this is is the CPAP approach. Um, and and did you guys consider that or talk more about that prior to the trial? Yeah, you may well be right, Brian. In at least some of the circumstances, I mean, specifically if you're if you're comfortable with the Lisa and risk procedure with babies on CPAP, then I totally agree with you that putting an endotracheal tube in is probably just as easy and, and in some cases easier. I guess um, with the Lisa or MIS procedure, generally babies are not uh, muscle relaxed or sedated, so they're usually mm -hmm. not apneic. In fact, um, with Lisa and MIST, one of the main aims is to have the spontaneously breathing mm -hmm. baby receive the surfactant. So that is one difference in this mm -hmm. trial that nearly all of the babies intubated in the NICU had received pre-medications and so were truly apneic for this procedure. Uh, so I guess it's a little bit dependent on the aim. And, you know, if you took it to the delivery room like we did in one quarter of the babies in this study, applying CPAP in the delivery room versus a lower profile prong might, might be easier to put the low, lower profile mm -hmm. prongs. And I guess, you know, the truth is that part of this came from our history of, of conducting trials in high flow and our and and you know seeing how easy they are to apply and how well liked they are and sort of searching for a role for high flow that could be um could be useful and, and specifically seeing the high flow used in pediatric and adult populations where where that high flow of gas, that movement of of uh, inspired gas seems to be a really important part of the effect of apneic oxygenation. So that's how we ended up with the high flow. But but I don't disagree with you that either using whatever the baby's on or potentially just supplemental oxygen may be almost as useful or just as useful, but we don't know from this study. And, and this is one of the issues with standalone randomized trials with two arms. You get to the end and you say, well, what about six litres? What about four litres? What about low flow? What about CPAP? Um, and that's just the way of the world. Yeah, and one, one question I have looking at your, your data, <clears throat> and it's impossible to sort of tell because you have the split between delivery room and and established babies in the NICU, but the, you know, 90% of these babies were on CPAP at the time, and the average FiO2 was over 60%. Um, that struck me as sort of being, that's a high level of, of FiO2. Uh, CPAP. Okay, we need, we need to clarify that. You're absolutely right. So just to be clear, that is the fraction of inspired oxygen immediately before the intubation attempt. So these babies were not, we didn't wait till they were on 60% to make a decision to intubate, although some of them would have been, you know, some of them would have been more emergent or deteriorating quickly or in the delivery room. Uh, but it's not our standard practice to wait until 60%. Usually we're making decisions in very preterm babies around 30 to 35%. But in some of these cases, and as it turned out equally between the groups, in preparation for the intubation, right. during the bag and mask and ventilation, pre -pre -pre the, yeah, there was a bit of either pre-oxygenation or it's hard to know what pre-oxygenation is, but 
the operator had turned up the oxygen. Yep. Okay. Interesting point. Uh, from the poll, it, um, it from the poll, we come to know that only thirty three percent of actually tracked their first intubation attempt outcome. I'm going to take some question from the audience. Uh, so, uh, centers impose a thirty second time limit on intubation attempts, especially for trainees, uh, regardless of baby's physiological status. So do you believe that providing high flow allow for a more physiology based time and can we extend this 30 second time limit we usually give uh, for the trainees? And I've been through this where I was given 30 second to intubate uh, if I cannot extend it longer. Well, one thing at a time, firstly, it's ridiculous in my opinion to limit the time to some arbitrary number and apologies to anyone on the NRP committee. But um, <laughs> as far as I'm aware, that number is made up. So uh, please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any uh, data to show that you should limit your intubation attempt in a stable baby with normal saturations and a normal heart rate to 30 seconds because it improves outcomes. I think this is just an arbitrary rule that's been imposed. Um, and absolutely, if we could extend that safe, if you like, apneic oxygenation time, although not all of these patients were apneic, um, then why not extend the duration of attempt? Certainly in my practice and in our practice, the duration of intubation, the intubation attempt continues while the baby is completely well, if there's a good view and, and it seems like that the intubation will soon be successful. Um, so I, I don't know of any good reason to, to pick 30 seconds other than people start to get a little bit nervous. But if the baby's well, then I don't know why we have to stop the intubation attempt at 30 seconds. I agree. So I think, um, um, uh, Brian, you have any other comments before we wrap this up? There's just one more question oh, jumping in from Joanna, who says, was the flow heated and humidified? Yes, it was. And sorry, we haven't really discussed that, but this was heated, humidified, high flow. And that's another thing that may or may not be important to, to the effect that we're seeing here. And of course, if you remove that heating and humidification as they will be in the, uh, in the North American trial, uh, or if you're using low flow, um, the outcomes could be different, but we don't know. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. So one, one final comment I'll make is kind of um, just to put things in perspective about this. And, and I'm, I think I'm the most senior person on the call. But back in the days when we were doing some of the early surfactant work, <clears throat> the type of surfactant that we were working with, um, the prophylactic dose in the delivery room, the protocol was to attempt to intubate the baby um, after birth before the baby took a first breath. Um, so you can imagine you get this little baby out who's slippery and slimy, and you're there trying to intubate this baby um, get the tube in, give the surfactant um, immediately by bolus after that into a lung that's still fluid filled and, and push it in with a, you know, 3cc per kilo aliquot of air to homogenize the distribution of surfactant. That was a very interesting um, challenge, um, but we got to the point where we could do that almost 100% of the time with success. So. so very great insight. Um, so we'll take some uh, closing comments. Uh, Jennifer, uh, excellent presentation, very thoroughly reviewed, uh, very well presented for it. Uh, before we um, uh, uh, close this meeting, uh, Dr. Manley, do you have any final comments for the trainees? Any future direction of uh, how the trial should go? For it and in summary, it's an excellent study, very pragmatic primary outcome uh, for it, and pretty timely given the decrease in patients uh, we are seeing. Uh, so it does support uh, the trainees and fellows, and therefore we are very grateful for someone doing this study and helping uh, us out for it. So any final comments, Dr. Mali? Firstly, thanks for having me, and Jennifer, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I guess just a few observations. Um, we do a lot of studies in neonatology that show no effect. Um, and when we do a study that shows effect, it takes a long time for people to believe it or put it into practice. We're going to do that based on this study. 
Um, and of course, we need to tinker around the edges. Could it be CPAP? Could it be low flow? Which babies? Which operators? Um, but here's something that's been shown to be beneficial, a bit like video laryngoscopy, and I think we should be using it because uh, I'm not sure what the proportion of successful trials in neonatology is, but this is one of our only successful trials, so um, I, I think we need to take take note. Secondly, I just want to point out what it takes to do a uh, well conducted trial and publish it in a big journal. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into these, a lot of attention to detail. We didn't really talk about it, but you know, things like publishing the trial protocol and making that available before you finish the trial and then publishing the statistical analysis plan means that when you get to a big journal, they can see that you've already said what you're going to do and you've done exactly what you said you were going to do or maybe you didn't and they'll point that out to you because almost always you forget something. Um, and having that sequence of ideally published trial documentation really aids the ability to get these trials published in big journals. And in fact, it's going to be an expectation moving forward. So just remember those things when you're planning trials or, or planning to publish them. So thanks so much for having me, everyone. And I would just concur. I thought uh, the, the presentation was really, really good. And I applaud the extra work you did going back and uh, reviewing the literature and summarizing that so succinctly. Um, I also appreciate that you took the time to go through the consort as a sort of teaching point. Maybe you've been doing that all along, but there will be a couple articles coming out if they haven't already just come out in pediatrics that um, look at um, um, how neonatology studies published in um, major journals, how they follow consort diagrams. And it turns out that it's not so great. There's... <laughs> There's a lot of room for improvement, as you'll see. And now we're on to, I think, consort 2020 as opposed to 2010. So yeah, I think that's, that's a great teaching point. So thank you for including that. Yeah. Uh, uh, please fill the survey link for today's session so we can keep improving uh, for it. And uh, just to remind everyone, uh, we have a next session on February 16 uh, on the on the February 15th, on the Optimist A trial, we have uh, Dr. Peter Dargavel and Dr. Uh, Ramanathan uh, from California. So please join us again for it. And uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It was a great session uh, getting to learn from you. And and uh, Dr. Manley is like, you've been like the trialist to look after for doing such any JM level trials uh, and from PhD student uh, leading the trial for it. Thank you so much. I uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. <laughs>